Good morning. This is Shea Seaborn, CPTSD. I'm a trauma awareness activist, educator, and artist. I'm the creator or instigator of Trauma Aware America on Facebook and traumaawareamerica.org, the website. And um, I've also started a new initiative called Interpersonal Neurobiology Revolution that aims to teach um, interpersonal neurobiology uh, one little bit at a time. Um, I'm a former tall ship sailor and I became a trauma awareness activist um, after I asked for help with developmental trauma which is the number one health crisis in the world. Five years ago today, I walked into the local uh, uh, satellite office of the major hospital system here in Delaware and explained that I had body-wide pain and um, PTSD from extreme childhood abuse and I needed help. Five years later, I'm still trying to recover from the help that I got. The standard treatment for PTSD nearly killed me. The uh, intern prescribed uh, Lexapro, a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, um, did not follow the black box uh, medication protocols uh, and the um, embedded psychologist uh, dismissed my complaints about this, the building suicidal ideations and that I thought it was coming from the pills. Um, and then he left town <laughs> uh, and, and didn't follow up on finding the kind of care that I needed. And the ideations became worse and finally the uh, prescribing physician said, don't ever take those pills again and go straight to whichever ER you like and tell them your doctor said um, you need a psych evaluation. She didn't tell me that they would deprive me of my belongings and clothing and contact with the outside world and put me in a cold room overnight uh, in isolation um, with nothing but a chair. They did give me a, a pencil and a piece of paper um, and be coerced into believing that I had a plan and that a few days at Rockford Center for Behavioral Health would be kind of like a little vacation and it would be, even more importantly, um, a gateway to services. Why I couldn't have services before I had to go there, I don't know. Oh, I do know. That's how the system is set up. So um, I said, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I'm going to like it. And he says, what do you think it'll be like? And I said, a cuckoo's nest. And he said, oh, no, no, it's great. You'll have um, uh, music therapy and, and, and art therapy and uh, time outside. It's really great. Unfortunately, I believed him. Uh, later that night, they brought in another distressed person. And um, I don't know what kind of training they get in the psych ER at that hospital downtown Wilmington, but... Um, the workers uh, certainly did not de-escalate things or use any kind of calming methods to help this distressed person. They uh, escalated the conflict and when the um, person, I don't want to even say patient, the person, the abused target of their um, their own issues uh, responded as they had expected um, they called security and everybody came in in a rush and pinned her down and shot her with the booty juice um, sedated her um, I was a witness to all this uh, I could hear everything that was going on and it triggered the heck out of me uh, both for the times I'd been pinned down and for the times that I'd been um, assaulted by uh, people in uniforms um, and when I told one of the employees there that I'd been triggered, he just looked at me like he had no idea what I was talking about. 
That is not health care. That is not mental health care. That is neglect and abuse. So uh, the morning came and um, they shipped me off to Rockford Center for Behavioral Health where the first thing that happened was uh, my rights were violated when the employee uh, made me sign the form that says I received the patient bill of rights before she would give me the patient bill of rights. She gave it to me just a few seconds before we entered the first locked door where my life would change forever because of the harm I encountered in the name of mental health care in America. There was no individual uh, therapy. Um, I was not informed of my treatment plan uh, for days and when I finally got the answer from the psychologist, Dr. Aisha Silman, uh, one of the most distressed people I've ever met. Um, she said, your, your treatment plan is go to group and take your pills. That's not a treatment plan. That's warehousing. She put me on a variety of medications which caused um, drowsiness, dizziness, uh, digestive problems, uh, brain fog, um, tiredness, and um, she wanted to put me on another SSRI. Fortunately, I wasn't on it long enough for it to mess me up too. Um, oh yes, and uh, back in the hosp in the uh, uh, with the prescribing physician, I had asked for a pharmacogenetic test that can show um, what kind of dosages are appropriate for my genetic makeup. A friend of mine in Virginia had shown me hers and it was very comprehensive and um, she described how uh, the medication she'd been on uh, showed that she was not very good at metabolizing it so she needed double the dose and um, so her doctor could double her dose and it worked for her. I finally got Oh yes, I asked for the test and they said, we don't do that here. I swear, pharmacogenetic tests should be mandatory before any prescription of any uh, psychotropic medication. They are that dangerous and this is so easy to prevent. It turns out I have two copies of the CYP2 gene that um, metabolizes SSRIs. So I'm an, um, an uh, what's it called? A uh, ultra metabolizer. I metabolize it twice as fast as anybody else. And guess what? That would explain the suicidal ideations. I was not making it up. It was a chemical imbalance in my body caused by the medication they put me on without checking to see if it was okay for my body to have this. So I ended up eight days and nights in uh, psychiatric uh, hospitals. Um, for an iatrogenic condition. That means one caused by the medical system and its abuse and neglect. That week in the cuckoo's nest did so much harm to my nervous system through the uh, um, sensory input, the way that uh, patients were treated, and the scare tactics they use um, Rockford Center for Behavioral Health as well as the Dover Hospital here in Delaware are owned by Universal uh, Health Services which um, UHS which own, is the largest uh, mental hospital chain in America. They own about 26 percent of the mental hospitals and they uh, post a uh, about a 30 percent um, profit which is double the industry standard um, through cutting services and staff. Um, this is widely known. Um, BuzzFeed News did an investigation, um, investigative report several years ago about <clears throat> UHS and how they uh, force their employees to trick patients into coming and into staying and also threaten them if they try to leave before their insurance benefit runs out, which is what they did to me and other people on that ward um, told me the same thing and I heard them threatening one person. They said, um, 
This was Nurse Ratchet. She lives. She was prettier and younger than the one in the movie, but she was just as evil, a social worker. She told somebody, yes, we got your your 72-hour release notice, and um, I just want you to know that um, if they fight this, they will win, and you will be committed. Whew. Terrifying words uh, for somebody who's so vulnerable and who knows they're being abused right now, and that if they're committed, they're going to be abused even further, and there won't be any help for them. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, roach infestation. Um, sewer back up in the kitchen, nasty food, uh, stale cooking oil, um, lots of fried stuff, mm. and uh, basically it was warehousing and drugging, uh, drugging to keep us uh, compliant and warehousing for the money. Um, one of the uh, <laughs> group therapy leaders came in and she was very young and said I'm sorry I've never given a group therapy session before and um, I've never had any training they didn't even give me a handout so I don't know what to do <laughs> and that was one of the better sessions <laughs> one of them was led by a person who just started talking uh, it, graphically about gun violence <laughs> wow uh, these are traumatized people we don't need to hear about gun violence thank you and um, so the noises and the lack of accommodations for my particular needs. Um, it was hard to get use of the telephone. Um, and um, they changed the, Dr. Silman changed my medication. Uh, when I told her I was feeling better and I was ready to go home now, um, after three days after that uh, Lexapro got out of my system, she switched my medications just a little bit up to the um, dosage of one and, and took away another and said, ah, well, now that I've changed your prescriptions, um, I have to keep you another 48 hours to make sure you're okay. And I was terrified that they would keep finding these excuses because the more I talked to people, the more I realized this is a cuckoo's nest and it's designed to keep you here until your money runs out or your insurance runs out. Um, and I was afraid that if they kept finding more reasons, like one guy was um, being kept there because um, they tested his urine and found he had a bladder infection, um, and somebody else had low calcium or magnesium or something, and they're like, oh, you can't go until we give you this treatment for a few days. So I was terrified of that because this place was just horrible for my nervous system. And, uh, yeah, I couldn't even get my room cleaned, like the bathroom was dirty when I moved into that room and it took five days of complaining every single day before somebody cleaned it and that was one of the nurses and it wasn't her job she just was one of the few people that still could care and so she did it for me I wasn't allowed to do it myself because I might like kill myself with cleaning supplies uh, and what else um by the time I got out of there, oh yeah, art therapy. We had two art therapy sessions, one of which was uh, making a collage as a project that the staff needed to get done. It wasn't really art therapy. It was, oh, cut out pictures of this for us to use on that. That's not art therapy. And uh, the, let's see. So I was in there for se in that cuckoo's nest for seven days. Couldn't believe when I finally got out. There was one nurse there. Um, I'm trying to remember her name because she was so wonderful. Um, her uh, cousin had been one of the crew on Calmer Nickel. Um, so she and I bonded over that. And she came in early and did my paperwork first ahead of everybody else and got me out of that place so I could go sail my ship. Um, and uh, aside from that, most of the people on staff there were burned out or uh, needed mental health care themselves. Um, by the time I got out of there, uh, even though I'd been artistic my whole life, I couldn't even hold a paintbrush. Um, it's like uh, developmentally I had to go back to preschool. I could only smash or uh, smear or blow or splatter the paint or paint it with my fingers for weeks that's all I could do and it could only be one color 
and then eventually I could pick up I don't see it here <laughs> my big brush my big kindergarten brush um, but it had to be one color and uh, over time I could add more colors and use different brushes and paint in different ways um, but that was a very clear uh, indication of how much the standard treatment for PTSD had damaged my nervous system. Um, but still, I didn't become a trauma awareness activist, artist, and educator. I just wanted to get healthy and get back on my ship. Live my lifelong dream that I came to Delaware to live. But that wasn't going to happen. The uh, damage was so great that I could barely function. And the lack of response from the harmful institution and the um, licensing board here in Delaware uh, was an institutional betrayal. They said that what happened to me was okay because it was standard care. <laughs> So did the insurance company, although they refused to pay for the last few days of care. They said that it was okay what was done to me. <laughs> it's like what happens to the human being doesn't matter. All that matters is the billing. In fact, um, in uh, I believe it was uh, early 2020, um, possibly the year before, um, Universal Health Services uh, settled a $122 million lawsuit with the Federal Department of Justice and I believe it was 15 states including Delaware for fraudulent billing Delaware got about $35,000 which is probably pennies on the dollar for what was stolen by this company and the penalties include that they have to be monitored uh, for fraudulent billing um, the whistleblowers, which was the SIEU union um, representing people that work at Rockford, they got six million dollars. And guess how much and what the victims got? That's right, zero. We got nothing. We didn't even get any say in how things should change. Um, we weren't even mentioned. The only problem was the fraudulent billing not the fraud committed against human beings that caused them tremendous harm. That's what America is about. That's what corporate Western, westernized corporate medicine is doing to essentially uh, people who were abused and neglected as children. That's where trauma comes from, abuse and neglect. And developmental trauma changes the arc of a person's life and the healthcare system just exploits and abuses them. I didn't become a trauma awareness activist until uh, when was it? Um, four years ago uh, after I had um, trusted a surgeon at the same hospital uh, with uh, performing surgery on me while I was knocked out and he performed two procedures on me without my consent that changed my body forever and caused me a lot of problems and the betrayal trauma from being having healthy tissue removed without necessity and without informed consent is extremely dangerous um, and harmful to a person especially when the medical system <clears throat> including your insurer and the Department of Justice say that it's okay because other doctors cut other women that way too. <laughs> Dr. Mengele lives and it's okay by the medical system because billing codes matter. Why would, why would a hospital allow this person to um, do this kind of thing so many times that uh, the nurse called it the Dr. Goldstein special? He's known for it. Other nurses have told me, oh yeah, if they're calling it the Dr. Goldstein special, it takes a lot of procedures for that to happen. Um, and it's okay because, guess what? It makes extra money for the hospital. CEO pay. <clears throat> Dr. Pay. 
So after that, <clears throat> I was so outraged, I asked, <laughs> when does it stop? Meaning the abuse in medicine. And my body said, when I make it stop. And I said, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> How do I do that? And my body said, I don't know. You figure it out, but listen to me on the way. <clears throat> so that's what I've been doing for the past four years. I created Trauma Aware America and um, the Interpersonal Neurobiology Revolution. And um, also uh, soon I will be um, <clears throat> unveiling um, people for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> people for medical rights and safety in a few days. Um, that is uh, an initiative to bring together uh, patients and providers who are being harmed by the medical system that exploits everyone um, to uh, demand change. Uh, we need safety and connection in medicine. One of my best doctors says that um, the rushing and disconnection are the so are the drivers of poor care and I agree and um, billing codes are the drivers of of uh, rushing and disconnection we need patient centered care not billing code centered care that's not care uh, what else here oh yeah the US has uh, one of the highest costs of health care in the world in 2021 spending reached 4.3 trillion dollars which averages about thirteen thousand dollars per person <laughs> and I wonder how much of it is due to harm <laughs> how much money has been made over uh, the follow-up care I've received from the system um, for the damage done to me by the system if this system was designed to help trauma survivors in the past five years I would have recovered so much I'd be back on my ship and having a great time and you wouldn't even know my name because I wouldn't have to be a trauma awareness activist or artist or uh, be disabled I'd be living a good life except for what this system did to me and it's robbed me of nearly everything my way of life my relationships uh, a significant portion of my health forever and um, all I really have left is my watercolors, words, and wits, and my determination to never stop talking it like Maya Angelou advised and um, to make it stop however I can, any way I can, as often as I can. And that means through education, legislation, and um, publicity. I have a legislative initiative um, to stop predatory doctors in Delaware and of course I have Trauma Aware America to inform anybody about um, trauma and recovery and how the system is against us and especially uh, that um, through an interpersonal neurobiology lens we are built to help ourselves and each other heal from trauma and other dysregulating experiences and even to recover from PTSD even prevent PTSD uh, I wanted to read this little um, excerpt from an article this actually this was from uh, a presentation at the 26th annual US Psychiatric and Mental Health Congress um, this was Carrie J Ressler MD PhD of Emory University if we understand the gene processes and neural processes and protein processes that are happening during the consolidation of the traumatic memories which take hours or days we could have this period where we intervene to prevent the development of PTSD and um, Dr. Ariel Schwartz notes that PTSD is never the fault of the individual but a failure of their environment This particularly means the psychosocial environment. 
meaning we're not getting enough psychosocial support, not the right kind and not enough of it. When a person has appropriate psychosocial support before, during, and after a dysregulating or traumatizing event, they don't develop PTSD. They recover quickly and go on to have a normal life. And that lack of psychosocial support is the driving force of what we call mental illness. It's actually a neurophysiological condition caused by feeling unsafe in the environment. So when our environment is safe, we feel safe. And when we feel safe, we can function better. And we can be pro-social and we have access to our prefrontal cortex and we can enjoy poetry and dance and music and art and intellectual stimulation. Those aren't luxuries when our nervous system is regulated. <clears throat> Unfortunately, most of us have dysregulated nervous systems to varying degrees, um, especially coming through a pandemic. Uh, pretty much nobody is immune to nervous system dysregulation. And that's why we need to understand the basics of our neurobiology. Because um, from a polyvagal informed lens, um, our dysregulated thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are generated by a dysregulated nervous system. When the nervous system is calm and safe, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are regulated. One of the most fascinating uh, aspects of this to me is that we use the same neural pathways for safe connection with other people as we do to regulate our body systems. So our body temperature, <clears throat> digestion, metabolism, blood flow, brain chemicals, all those things are affected by our relationships. Indeed, the number one predictor of a person's um, mental, so-called mental health, which is health, is the quality of their relationships. <clears throat> Each one of us needs a few high-quality relationships where we feel seen and heard and felt and believed and sometimes helped. That makes us feel secure as human beings in our nervous system. We need this kind of safety some people call it psychological safety, but it's safety. We have to be safe to be who we are in our social environment or we are not safe. Our bodies are not safe. Our bodies are on red alert. One of the most fascinating uh, things I've learned in interpersonal neurobiology is that um, compassion and kindness help integrate the brain. What? Yes. <laughs> That's because we use the same neural pathways for those as we do for regulating our nervous system. So those of us who experienced early <clears throat> developmental trauma, whose parents were not able to regulate their own brains, minds, bodies, behavior, feelings, and thoughts, um, couldn't teach us how to regulate our own. So for me, I've lived a dysregulated life all these years. Um, there have been times when I was better regulated, when um, my resources were greater, uh, when I had st housing stability and financial stability and a partner who was uh, at least marginally good for me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, the community, the connections in my community are what really sustained me. Those are all things that were destroyed by the harm done to me by the medical system. I lost my capacity to trust other people, uh, especially men, especially doctors. Uh, but my nervous system was terrified of pretty much everybody after this egregious harm. Betrayal after betrayal teaches your nervous system that you can't trust anybody. And cognitively, I know, it's pretty unlikely that I'm going to encounter <clears throat> another doctor who's as evil as that one. Um, <clears throat> but my nervous system can't trust any of them to knock me out. Not even my favorite doctor, my very most trusted doctor. 
I can't be knocked out ever again, probably. <clears throat> the harm was that great. The terror was that high. In part, in large part, not just because the surgery was non-consensual, but because that's what he intended. He's a predator who mutilates women's genitals <laughs> in the name of medicine and gets away with it because the system fostered his MO and uh, protects him instead of his patients. That's what the medical system does. Initially, I thought <clears throat> all these problems I was having with this hospital uh, here in Delaware was were um, just this hospital is that pr problematic, that toxic, that dangerous an environment for human beings and health. Um, but the more I've interacted with other people uh, who also have medical PTSD, um, the more I realize this is standard in America. That hospital, as, um, as uh, toxic and even malignant as it can be, um, isn't unusual. It's the whole system is set up this way to um, make profits and human beings don't matter. It exploits the healthcare practitioners as much as it does the patients <clears throat> and maybe sometimes more. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> the doctor suicide rate is double the national average. And remember, PTSD is an environmental condition. So is suicide. Suicide doesn't happen in environments that are supportive of human well-being. It happens to those and in environments that are not supportive and those who have not been supported. The uh, According to Dr. Uh, to uh, Pamela Weibel, MD, who's known as the suicide doc <clears throat> because she's pretty much the only one who talks about the epidemic of doctor suicide. Every year, a million Americans lose a doctor to suicide. <clears throat> and the highest, uh, the highest incidence of suicide is in the category of young male pain specialists who care. That would be three of my very best doctors. And the idea of any of them being in that kind of distress, being that abused by the system uh, and losing them and their amazing care uh, and the effect that it would have on their families and their friends and their patients and me um, is horrific to even imagine. <clears throat> but they are at risk because the system exploits them the most. Um, one of my doctors told me, one of my pain specialists told me they get five minutes per patient. Pain specialty, which is a complex specialty. Five minutes. <laughs> that's, that's stressful for everyone, <clears throat> except the CEO <clears throat> and the investors. Mm. Let's see, what else do I have here? Mm. Yes, um, treatment for PTSD. True treatment for PTSD or any mental health condition should start helping you feel better virtually immediately. If it doesn't, and if you're not feeling better after a few weeks and you're actually feeling worse, that might be treatment, but it's not the treatment you need, even if it's standard care. <clears throat> I believe standard care is a one-size-fits-nobody uh, billing code acronym. Um, Let's see. I'm talking so fast. <laughs> oh, yes, I wanted to talk about um, Delaware. I can't speak about other states too much, but in Delaware, it seems like the entire so-called health care system is set up to funnel people to cuckoo's nests. There's no real concern unless we're suicidal. And then it's Exploitation City when the residential treatment contractual clause comes into play. You either pull yourself up by your bootstraps or you're in the cuckoo's nest. There's no uh, care until critical. There's no before stage four 
plan for us. <clears throat> I also want to talk about the uh, abysmally poor care that um, sexual abuse survivors uh, receive here in Delaware. I've had um, encounters with um, both the uh, YWCA um, SARC program and the uh, SOAR, S-O-A-R, which made me S-O-R-E, uh, program. I go into these, whenever I meet a therapist, I come in with a 10-page document that explains my trauma because I don't want to talk about it again and re-traumatize myself. And I'd worked on this document for years to make it very clear I am an exceptional case. <clears throat> I've been through exceptional trauma. I'm exceptionally vulnerable, and I need exceptional care. And they signed me to <laughs> somebody who's just now reading The Body Keeps the Score <laughs> and who doesn't seem to understand that her crossed legs and crossed arms are telling her client, you don't want to hear her. And um, <laughs> I ended up being more harmed by both of those therapists then helped. Fortunately, by the time I got to the SARC therapist recently, I knew what I was looking for and knew what the red flags were and quit that after three weeks. Um, sexual assault survivors should get the very best care, the, the best kind of somatically oriented, trauma-informed treatment. But we don't get that here in Delaware. We get crap. We get the people who... <clears throat> Uh, can't fit in anywhere else, I guess. That's what it seems like. Uh, and who's monitoring them? Who's checking on them to make sure they're not harming clients? As far as I can tell, nobody. As far as I can tell, none of the providers that have harmed me, and I'm just talking mental health. I'm not talking about, you know, being cut on. Um, uh, they've, they've had no uh, accountability at all. And no retraining, nothing. It's like talking into a void. Oh, you didn't like our care? Well, too bad. That's not care. Um, one of the biggest problems I've encountered is denial of my trauma by pretty much everybody. Uh, friends, family, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, Hopkins Pain Clinic, and um, therapists. Um, that denial causes trauma survivors to question their perceptions of reality and their ability to perceive their self and figure things out and trust themselves. That compounds the trauma. <laughs> um, so one of my tasks has been to winnow out the people who um, cannot understand or are not open to understanding the neurobiological underpinnings of trauma um, and who continue to uh, hold on to the biomedical model which is largely disproven now, increasingly disproven um, and uh, also victim blaming uh, paradigms like um, just let it go or forgive and forget or even uh, take this yoga class and you'll be better um, or those who just don't want to hear it. I get it. You don't want to hear it. It triggers you. It reminds you of your trauma, and you don't even realize that's what's happening. Or it's just too hard for you to wrap your head around uh, a human being treating another human being so horribly. Um, even if I don't go into details, just the basic facts of the abuse are horrific. It's hard to grasp, and it's hard to accept that people do this to each other. I'm not that much of an exception. People do horrible things to each other and we need to learn how we can help each other recover from these things and that's how they're going to stop. I also want to talk about um, cues of threat and cues of safety. Many things in our daily lives tell our brains the world is dangerous news, politics, fake news, physical distancing, face covering, extra hand washing. These are all danger signals to our threat detection system. Constant threat signaling changes the function of the brain 
and over time it's very architecture. This is highly neuronegative and uh, attunes the person for a difficult life trajectory. Our, neg our innate negativity bias can spin us deeper into fear and um, that creates negative consequences which sets the fear deeper. We inadvertently tune our brains and bodies for pain and dysfunction because we don't know better. That's why I keep saying when we understand the basics of our neurobiology we don't have to be driven by it. I'm not talking about learning deep neuroscience. I'm talking about simple concepts and terms for what's already happening in your body and when you understand this you recognize what these feelings are and you can honor them and thereby improve your quality of life. Ta -da -da. Wow, I've run out of stuff to say. <laughs> oh, here's one. Um, uh, what I need to do now, well actually what we all need to do after we've had trauma is replace old bad memories with new good experiences. So um, I've been working to recover uh, some of my sense of safety in the medical field. Um, number one, uh, I cut back on medical encounters for about three months. I'm in the middle of that right now. Um, I'll start more medical care next month. Um, I'm at the end of a, a three month period and two years ago I did three months with minimal medical care only going to the most necessary appointments and um, and uh, those that are with providers who actually help my nervous system which was two um, <laughs> including my pain specialist who's my number one doctor um, so uh, one of the big things I've learned is that a lot of yeah, I got kicked out of that hospital um, about a year ago because I wouldn't shut up about the Dr. Goldstein special and um, I lost all three of my best providers at the time which was very difficult um, and it took a lot of work and trouble to find um, pain specialists who could um, continue my best doctor's care plan um, and uh, they work out of a different um, surgical center, a freestanding surgical center, where I've had four procedures so far. And this has shown me how much of my medical PTSD is actually about the institution that caused the harm. Uh, going to this surgical center that's not on the big hospital campus, um, that is. Uh, devoid of logos of that um, hospital, um, I feel so much safer. Um, I don't even have to smoke medical marijuana before I go in anymore. Oh, I used to have to smoke, like, sit out in the car and toke up and then go in and check in and then go in the bathroom and toke up. I used a vape pen so it wouldn't stink up things, but still, I had to be, like, practically stoned just to go to my best doctor because the PTSD was that bad and uh, now I can go to my trusted doctors without any medical marijuana at all, which is great. Um, so yes, um, now um, my medical PTSD is down quite a bit um, just because I got out of that toxic hospital system. So if you have medical PTSD, maybe you can get into a different system too, out of the one that caused you harm. I don't know that the uh, other hospital system here is any better in um, trauma-informed care or uh, or um, letting uh, predatory providers roam the halls and cut people up at will. Um, but so far I haven't been intentionally harmed and that makes it a much safer place for me. Um, one of the, uh, well, the main tenet of um, interpersonal neurobiology is that the brain, mind, and relationships integrate and alter one another. That can be kind of hard to grasp um, 
but it's it's really amazing when you can understand it. Um, it's a little scary and super cool. The brain, mind, and relationships change each, alter, integrate, and alter one another. So, um, the things that I think alter my brain and my relationships. The kind of relationships I have alter my brain and the ways I think. And uh, my altered brain uh, affects the ways I think and my relationships. And coming back to relationships as the number one indicator of uh, mental health, relationships are really important for having um, an integrated brain and a calm, clear, pro-social, regulated mind. And I'm feeling like I'm pretty well done here. <laughs> My body's saying, whew, this is a lot. And uh, I want to say hi to Chris. Thank you, Chris, for coming. I really appreciate you being here and your comment. Um, and um, everybody, uh, thank you for watching. And you can ask questions. And this will be up for um, viewing uh, as you wish. And... Um, I will look forward to celebrating with you further my five-year survival celebration. Thanks and have a great day.